Uh, Donald Trump, much like Mar-a-Lago, is a roach motel. Now, roach motels are very popular here in New York City. They're boxes that lure roaches inside. And once the roaches get inside, they, they can't come out. And that's what Trump is. He's a roach motel. He lures feeble-minded roaches into his orbit. They get stuck. They can't go anywhere because nobody wants them. And they just wither and disappear. Rudy, Mark Meadows, Peter Navarro, these are all demented halfwits with rage issues, and they fall right into Donald Trump's trap. Come on in. Enjoy the sticky floor. Show me how angry you are. Yeah, that's it. Just rail against the, the woke mob. That's it. They all, fall, they all fall for it. And that's why the only people who work with or for Trump are not just criminals, they are halfwits with anger issues. So some tape, some video of the My Pillow guy, Mike Lindell, uh, some tapes of his deposition back in March were made public on Friday, and I have the clips, and I'm going to play them at the end of this morning's show because it's so foul, so revealing, uh, I just can't play it till the end. Uh, it's just too disgusting. This guy is way more violent than he lets on. I know he had crack cocaine issues. I didn't realize the level of rage inside of this guy. You'll see. Uh, you know, I didn't believe it when I read that Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, who definitely needs a good night's sleep, <laughs> he's not, he's got to switch pillows. Lindell, apparently was in on the Oval Office meeting in December of 2020, urging Donald Trump to invoke the Insurrection Act. That was Mike Lindell's big push. And I never really believed he was serious, but uh, I, I looked at these clips from the deposition and I thought, and you'll see, is like, wow, Trump's a, a roach motel. Every demented halfwit with anger issues gets lured in, and they're destroyed, every single one of them. It's, it's phenomenal. He really, he really is a genius, Donald Trump. But first, this is the mop-up for September 9th. Wow, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Hurricane Lee is now back to a Category 4 after doubling its wind speeds and becoming a Category 5 in what is now being called an historic storm acceleration. An historic storm acceleration, considering she was just a 1 yesterday. It's amazing. She goes from a 1 to a 5 overnight. Sounds like every plastic surgery nightmare in Beverly Hills. The National Hurricane Center says Lee is roughly 500 miles off the coasts of Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands meteorologists are not certain whether Lee will hit the United States. And as we know, if it hits everywhere but the United States, it doesn't exist. Even if it hits Puerto Rico, we saw what happened. Our, our colony, Puerto Rico, we saw what happened when that hurricane hit uh, Puerto Rico. Well, by Wednesday of next week, the storm is expected to smash into Cuba with no sign of it weakening as Lee literally picks up steam off the increasingly hotter Atlantic Ocean. We know this. The Atlantic Ocean is getting hotter because of climate catastrophe, because of the oil companies. And it's just feeding off the ocean and getting just immediately became a Category 5. Right now it's a 4, but they think it can go back up to a 5. To give you an idea how quickly this storm formed, if you remember as recently as Wednesday morning, we were being told that this was probably not a significant weather event, and they were saying that Lee might stay at a 1 or a 2. Okay. Environmentalists in Spain spray-painted the chaos... That's a luxury super yacht owned by Walmart, Walmart heiress Nancy Walton Lorry. They spray painted the chaos while it was docked in Ibiza earlier this week. This is now the second time that her yacht has been spray painted by environmentalists. The 
let's call it the refurbishment of her super yacht, was performed by activists from Futuro Vegetal, who posted a before and after video. And after they performed the much needed fixing up of the Walmart heiress's yacht, they held signs that read, you consume, others suffer. You consume, others suffer. They then pointed out that, quote, this is what they said in their tape, the richest 1% of the world population pollutes more than the poorest 50%. They are condemning us to a future of pain, misery, and desolation. Amen. I mean, unquote. It is worth noting, however, that this boat belongs to an heir to the Walmart fortune, which has already condemned us to a future of pain, misery, and desolation. Walmart, I don't think this woman cares. Walmart is an anti-union, multinational corporation that pays its employees so little here in America that after the employees sign their start work papers, the Walmart manager then hands them applications for food stamps. And I am not making that up. Welcome to Walmart. Thank you for filling out all, you know, your social security and the time cards. Now go apply for food stamps, because if you just live on the wages we're paying you, you're going to starve to death. Google it. The U.S. Open here in New York was delayed 45 minutes while several climate activists wearing end fossil fuel T-shirts stood up from the audience and began chanting that oil companies need to be put out of business. Amen. Three of the four protesters were escorted from the stadium. Coco Groff, who was competing at the time, she went on to win later. Uh, she told reporters after the protest, after she won, she said throughout history, moments like this are definitely defining moments. She added... I believe climate change is real. I don't really know exactly what they were protesting. I know it was about the environment. I 100% believe in that, unquote. We're going to need more of this, more peaceful protesting, more peaceful disruption. Uh, it's either the planet or the oil companies. You, you can have two things, but you, you, you have a choice. You can either have oil companies, or you can have an inhabitable planet, but you can't have both, okay? Of course, conservatives were furious that the U.S. Open had been disrupted. Uh, this was neither the time nor the place, blah, 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 you know, pick your battles. But conservatives hate protests unless they're violent protests, like, you know, attacking our nation's capital or when it's a protest against undocumented immigrants. Then you can be as violent as you want. Who cares what the consequences are? Here is the odious Curtis Sliwa, uh, terrible human being, just bad. But he's an opportunistic right-wing infection. He's one of the original vigilantes. He's, he founded the Guardian Angels, uh, he was saying uh, the police aren't going to protect us, so we're going to wear red berets and patrol the streets. But somehow now he's become this folk hero with his paramilitary operation. These extrajudicial thugs, the guardian angels, who are saying the police can't do their jobs, so we're going to do it for them. But we support the police. Sure you do. He is welcome on AM Talk Radio. He has his own show. They love him on Fox News because he's a violent, pus-filled vigilante. Here is the vigilante founder of the Guardian Angels, Curtis Sliwa, on Sean Hannity's Fox News show, warning Americans and undocumented migrants. He's warning them of the kind of protests he has in store for New York City, and of course our police, if these migrants don't stop coming to New York City. If you're an illegal alien, you're joining the invasion, and they are going to overwhelm us. 
I will not allow that. I am the mayor in exile, like Napoleon on the island of Elba. I will block the bridges. I will stop the buses. We will turn them around. Go back to where you came from. You don't belong here. You're illegal. You have held a number of demonstrations. You are now threatening to shut down the bridges in New York City. How real is that threat? Oh, very real. You've seen this before, and it's truckers who are the most patriotic, the most American. The independent truckers, 18-wheel tractor trailer drivers, are willing to risk their rigs. They will block every entrance and exit. They will take the keys out, walk away, and say, tough noogies, you're not coming in to our city, our state, and our country anymore. If the politicians won't do it, the people will do it. Okay, so some people interrupt the U.S. Open. Fox News is all over them. They're violent. They're terrorists. Here you have this pus-filled vigilante, Curtis Sliwa, saying, Oh, we're going to get the truckers to shut down the entire, entire city. Four climate protesters peacefully interrupt the U.S. Open to peacefully draw attention to the role fossil fuel plays in killing us. They're terrorists, according to Sean Hannity and Curtis Sliwa. But Curtis Sliwa, this pus-filled vigilante, says he's going to shut down traffic going in and out of New York City, grind our economy and emergency vehicles to a halt. But on Fox News, he's a patriotic American exercising his right to protest. Well, I want to clear some stuff up here. Please indulge me. I want to clear up some lies about Black Lives Matter that just keep getting repeated. And I've talked about this before, but Hitler, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, taught the Republicans that if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. And I've been over this before on the show, but I'm getting really sick of how nobody corrects the Republicans when they talk about Black Lives Matter, which is the most successful civil rights movement since the 1960s. We are seeing wave after wave of reform in cities because of BLM. More prosecutors of color are getting elected. Prosecutors like Fawny Willis down in Georgia. She was elected in 2020 thanks to Black Lives Matter protests. There's a record number of prosecutors who are people of color uh, who were elected in Georgia in 2020 because of Black Lives Matter. And no matter how much the media demonizes Black Lives Matter, every week we read of these massive multi-million dollar settlements paid out here in New York City, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, paid out to Black Lives Matter protesters because, and I have the receipts, so you're going to have to put up with this for a few minutes because I'm getting really angry about this. I brought receipts. Uh, study after study shows that Black Lives Matter protests were peaceful and the violence that we saw was caused by the police who showed up ready to do damage. Because why? Because these were protests against the police. These were protests against the police killing, right, George Floyd. These were protests against the police shooting and killing unarmed black people. That's what the police are guilty of. Not all of them, but way too many. And those protests, well, when you call someone on their bullshit, they turn violent. Try it. Find out what someone's bullshit is. And you call them on it, they'll punch you. And the police got violent. Uh, any looting, this is according to study after study, and I brought some receipts. Uh, study after study shows that any looting that was done was done not by Black Lives Matter protesters. It wasn't sanctioned by Black Lives Matter protests. It was sanctioned by Asian provocateurs, outside agitators, police officers, or, and this is really important, okay, much of the violence that we saw at Black Lives Matter protests came from protesters protesting 
Black Lives Matter, right? Counter protesters. And of course, Kyle Rittenhouse, who ended up killing two, injuring one with his AR-15, and he ended up getting acquitted because he's white. Uh, There is no Black Lives Matter analog to Kyle Rittenhouse. There is not a Black Lives Matter protester who showed up with an AR-15 and decided to protect Black Lives Matter protesters from counter protesters. Study after study shows that because it was black people protesting, the police showed up in massive numbers when they didn't have to. They could have just let let them march. There was no need for the police to show up. They they came, the police came heavily armed with military grade weapons and study after study shows that when the police show up heavily armed with weapons, they use those weapons, especially on people of color. That is what study after study going back to the 60s, reveals. For example, there were more heavily armed police officers patrolling Black Lives Matter protests than there were for those women marches when Trump was inaugurated. They had women marches all over the country when Trump was inaugurated. Police barely showed up. And and need I remind you, and, and this just should go without saying, need I remind you of how few police there were on January 6th protecting the Capitol? They knew, everybody knew what was about to happen, but, you know, it was just white, white people carrying the Confederate flag. This is a fact. When black people protest, statistically, There are always way more police officers monitoring the march, and they are way more armed. So I got some receipts, and you should check this out and and read this and, and stop, speak truth to the lie that Black Lives Matter protests were violent or as vi- the new meme is, uh, you know, the, January 6th was no more violent than Black Lives Matter. These are, I'm going to show you some stories. You should uh, get the links. I'll include them in the description of the show. OK, this is from The Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos. OK, no fan of Black Lives Matter. Washington Post. Uh, where am I here? Headline. Let me read the headline first. OK. Headline. This was October 16th, 2020. It's written by Erica Chenoweth and Jeremy Pressman. This is for The Washington Post. Headline. This summer's Black Lives Matter protesters were overwhelmingly peaceful. Our research finds. Okay. In fact, the Black Lives Matter uprisings were remarkably nonviolent. When there was violence, very often police or counter protesters were reportedly directing it at the protesters. Washington Post. The data on those protests shows very little violence. Here is what we have found based on the 7,305 events we've collected. There were 7,305 Black Lives Matter protests across America in 2020. Okay? This is going to blow you away how peaceful. This is the, the biggest civil rights movement since the 60s. Maybe some people say in terms of sheer numbers, Black Lives Matter bigger than the the protests in the 60s in terms of sheer numbers. I don't think we had 7,305 separate protests in the 60s. Maybe, I don't know. But I've heard people say that BLM is at least as big as what we saw 
in the 60s. Here is what we have found based on the 7,305 events we've collected. The overall levels of violence and property destruction were low. And most of the violence that did take place was, in fact, directed against the BLM protesters. Again, this is the Washington Post. This is mainstream media. Protesters or bystanders were reported injured in 1.6 percent of the protests. In total, at least three Black Lives Matter protesters and one other person were killed while protesting in Omaha, Austin, and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Hmm, Kenosha, Wisconsin, Kyle Rittenhouse. One anti-fascist protester killed a far-right group member during a confrontation in Portland, Oregon. Law enforcement killed the alleged assailant several days later. So there's only one example of somebody who identifies as Antifa killing a far-right protester, okay? Look up that story. Uh, that, the death of that alleged Antifa guy, it's questionable. There, there's been a bit of a cover-up on his death. But let's give you, I'll give you one, okay? One so-called Antifa doesn't exist, but we'll give you one, okay? More from the Washington Post, same story. Police were reported injured in 1% of the protests. A law enforcement officer killed in California was allegedly shot by supporters of the far-right Boogaloo movement, not anti-racism protesters, okay? The killings in the line of duty of other law enforcement officers during this period were not related to the protests, okay? All you hear on Fox News and from Republicans like Jim Jordan is how dangerous it was for police officers during the Black Lives Matter protests. These are the facts, and nobody corrects them. This is from the Washington Post. Okay, let me read it again. Police were reported injured in 1% of the protests. A law enforcement officer killed in California was allegedly shot by supporters of the far-right Boogaloo movement, not anti-racism protesters. The killings in the line of duty of other law enforcement officers during this period were not related to the protests. You wouldn't know that if you listened to Republican politicians. They, they have us convinced that Black Lives Matter protesters were assassinating cops. I cannot stress this enough. No cops were killed by any Black Lives Matter protesters. There's only one cop who was killed, and he was killed by somebody from the Boogaloo Boys, a far-right group that Jimmy Dore has on his show. Okay, I will continue. This is, I think, some of the most important writing that you can read and share with your friends. I don't think there's anything more important than this information. And this is just from the Washington Post. Read the New York Times, the Associated Press. This is what's coming out of mainstream media. We're not talking about Jacobin, the nation. We're talking about mainstream media reporting this, okay? And our government. They're working off NGO reports and government reports. But you wouldn't know this listening to Republican politicians or the news media. I mean, this is the news media, but... This should be parroted on MSNBC and CNN every night. In many instances, again, from the Washington Post, and by the way, this is, as I'm saying, this, this has been reported everywhere. It just hasn't been amplified. In many instances, police reportedly began or escalated the violence, but some observers never Nevertheless, blame the protesters. The claim that the protests are violent 
even when the police started the violence, can help local, state and federal forces justify intentionally beating, gassing or kettling the people marching or reinforces politicians' calls for law and order. OK, a little editorializing, but I agree with that. OK, now this is going to be very uncomfortable. I, I'm going to go over something here that is very uncomfortable and it's going to shake up a lot of people's worldview when it comes to cops. So let me state up front. This is some of the most important information that anybody's going to tell you. OK, I have a problem with cops. I have uh, some relatives who are cops. I know what they're capable of doing. They, sometimes they work as social workers. They're capable of uh, bringing immense joy to people's lives when they work as cops. Anytime a cop is assaulted or killed, it is a tragedy. And, and it is an attack on all of us because we do need police officers. And when you attack a police officer, you're attacking the government. And that's a hate crime. And, and police are a protected class. What happened on January 6th was a disgrace. When you punch a cop, you are punching America. OK. Now that I got that out of the way. Again, I'm very critical of police because I love America and I believe in the Bill of Rights. And our founding fathers gave us 10 amendments to the Constitution that pretty much outlines, I, I, I would say more than half, if not three quarters of the Bill of Rights are basically saying, don't trust the police. Don't trust the government and don't trust the police. If you trust the police, you don't love this country. Anybody with power should not be trusted. OK, but I support the police. They are deeply flawed. And it is a tragedy when a police officer is killed. It is a tragedy, not just for the family. It is a tragedy for our government and our country because we do need police. OK, now here are some important facts. Go to Police One. It's a website. There are many websites that monitor the tragedy of police officers being killed. OK, Police One has a, a, a section of their website called Officer Down, and it is very sad. And you should donate. They have some charities and you should support the families. OK. This is uh, a screenshot from today's officer down. This is a list of officers. They keep a, a running tally of the, the, tra the tragedy of police officers getting gunned down or killed. Uh, most police officers die in traffic accidents. They, 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 most of them, for example, and this is just the top of the page. Uh, late Friday night, a Connecticut officer killed, another hospitalized after vehicle crashes into cruiser. Next one, te de Texas deputy dies in crash on his second day on the job. Next one is Georgia sheriff killed in car crash while responding to a call. Uh, next one is uh, Florida sheriff's office, uh, captain flight medic killed in helicopter crash. Next one is Nevada officer killed while trying to stop fling suspect. Uh, I don't know if he was shot or not, but this idea that cops, cops do die on, on the job, sadly, but mostly from car accidents, not from getting shot. They're afraid of getting shot, but more and more cops are getting shot to death, but they mostly, sadly, die from car accidents, okay? This came out, uh, it was published in the Milwaukee Independent in 2020, okay? This is very difficult to go over, but it's really important. 
This is stuff that's out there. These are legitimate news sources. They're working off government websites, government agencies. And I'm going to read you something from the Milwaukee Independent. And uh, it's a little uncomfortable to read, but I'm going to do it. This is from the Milwaukee Independent, and this is from 2020 in response to everybody saying how violent Black Lives Matter was and this constant refrain that cops were being killed by these protesters. Okay, they weren't. From Milwaukee Independent 2020. Please pay attention to this and and let's put an end to this lie, please, about Black Lives Matter. 25 active duty law enforcement officers have been shot and killed around the country so far this year. Uh, This was written in 2020, and I believe it was around October. I I don't know when it was. It was written when the Black Lives Matter protests were uh, getting quiet because of the weather. Okay. 25 active duty law enforcement officers have been shot and killed around the country so far this year. Six of those have occurred since the George Floyd protests began, but none have been directly related to the protests. Okay, and they're working off that website that I just sent you to police one officer down. Okay, again, six of those deaths have occurred since the George Floyd protests began, but none have been directly related to the protests. Last year, that would be 2019, 48 officers were shot and killed across the country. In 2018, 52 officers were shot and killed in the line of duty. That is an average of one officer each week over the past several years. Very important. We average one police officer getting shot to death each week. You would think the police chiefs would get together and try to ban Assault weapons and guns make everybody safer. From the Milwaukee Independent, I appreciate the people who choose to risk their lives by becoming police officers. Amen. I know many current and retired police officers. Policing is an inherently dangerous profession, but we cannot equate all of the recent police officers ambushed and killed across the country with the protests when there is no evidence to connect them together. I understand the alarm police have when they hear a fellow officers being murdered, but we must not equate the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests about police reform as being the cause of shooting deaths of police officers, as some have asserted. This is a lie. This is a lie that just keeps getting repeated. And I'm effing sick of it. More from the Washington Post. Given that protesters, I I talked about calling people on their bullshit and they get violent. Try that with somebody. Figure out somebody's lie that they tell to themselves and others and call them on it and they'll punch you. If it's a man, he'll punch you. This is from the Washington Post. Given that protesters were objecting to extrajudicial police killings of black citizens, protesters displayed an extraordinary level of nonviolent discipline, particularly for a campaign involving hundreds of documented incidents of apparent police brutality. The protests were extraordinarily nonviolent and extraordinarily non-destructive given the unprecedented size of the movement's participation and geographic scope. It's a breathtaking paragraph from the Washington Post 2020. Breathtaking. I'm going to continue. I told you I brought receipts, and you have to indulge me because... I've had it. 
Washington Post. Protesters or bystanders were reported injured in 1.6% of the protests. In total, at least three Black Lives Matter protesters and one other person were killed. Uh, Did I read this already? Yeah, I'm going to read it again. Uh, In total, at least three Black Lives Matter protesters and one other person were killed while protesting in Omaha, Austin, and Kenosha, Wisconsin. One anti-fascist protester killed a far-right group member during a confrontation in Portland. Law enforcement killed the alleged assailant several days later. And that was a Boogaloo boy. No, it wasn't. It was a different story. Okay. This is just to show you that it's not just the Washington Post. If you Google this, you can find many, many stories. This is from Time Magazine. You don't get any more mainstream than Time Magazine. 93% of Black Lives Matter protests have been peaceful. New report finds. And 93%, I'm gonna, this article talks about the 7%, what the violent, what constitutes violence. Okay, so this is from... 2020, this is written by Sonia Mansour, September 5th, 2020, okay? 93%, and let's let's find out what the 7% is. The vast majority, she writes, the vast majority of Black Lives Matter protests, more than 93%, have been peaceful, according to a new report published Thursday by a nonprofit that researches political violence and protests across the world. It is an NGO. It, it, it's paid for partly by our State Department. The Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, which is subsidized by several governments, including ours. This might as well be the government. The Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project analyzed more than 7,750 Black Lives Matter demonstrations in all 50 states in Washington, D.C. that took place in the wake of George Floyd's death between May 26 and August 22. The report includes protests toppling, this is the 7%, right? I, seven, 93% were nonviolent, but what was the violence? Okay, this. The report includes protests toppling statues of colonial figures, slave owners, and Confederate leaders as violent incidents. Since Floyd's killing, there have been at least 38 incidents in which demonstrators have significantly damaged or torn down memorials around the country, the report says. So it's cons- if you pull down a statue of Jefferson Davis, that's considered violence, okay? According to the report. More from Time Magazine. And this is breathtaking. Still, okay, they're saying 93, that they're saying that Black Lives Matter protests were completely peaceful. But still, Time Magazine writes, many people continue to believe that Black Lives Matter protests are largely violent, contrary to the report's findings. This report highlights a recent morning consult poll in which 42% of respondents believe, quote, most protesters associated with the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter movement, are trying to incite violence or destroy property, unquote. The NGO that did the study suggests this is, quote, This disparity stems from political orientation and biased media framing, such as disproportionate coverage of violent demonstrations. I remember if a cop car was on fire, that's all you saw. You know? Well, we'll wrap this up with the Washington Post. They did a study partially blinded by police. Eight people suffered severe eye injuries at protests across the country on May 30th. That was, remember George Floyd was murdered. It was Memorial Day weekend. And by May 30th, people took to the streets. Eight people suffered severe eye injuries at protests across the country on May 30th. 
In three instances, video evidence undermines official accounts of what happened. The Washington Post found that eight people lost vision in one eye after being struck by police projectiles, including lead pellets packed in cloth pouches that were fired from shotguns. They were among 12 people who were partially blinded by police during a week of national unrest. So what we have are police riots. And this is why my city of New York is paying out millions upon millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter protesters. This was this, the city settled. It's incontrovertible. There's video. Look up. Watch the videos that the New York Times prepared showing how the New York City cops, what they did to Black Lives Matter protesters, ramming their cars into them, just hopping, covering their badges and wearing face masks and just beating the crap out of protesters. Women, look at the videos over at the New York Times. It's why uh, New York City just paid out $11 million to Black Lives Matter protesters. In the city, in, in the Bronx, which is a borough of New York City, they paid hundreds of Black Lives Matter protesters, something like $20,000 each, for being roughed up. And our state attorney general, I talked about this earlier in the week, has had to step in and uh, she was ready to sue the New York City police. Look at what Philadelphia paid out, eight million. There is no question that the police created a lot of violence during the Black Lives Matter protests. It, it costs money. Uh, it's not the other way around. It's the police who who caused the violence. And this lie that Black Lives Matter protests were violent because of Black Lives Matter protesters, this lie has to end. It has to end. And I'm asking everybody who is listening right now to gather up these stories and put together a binder, print it out, and and put together a binder from the Washington Post, from the New York Times, from Time Magazine, and some of these government agencies, these studies, and carry it with you so that next time somebody says Black Lives Matter protests were violent, speak the truth to the lie. Because this lie is one of the major sources of our problems here in America. It's why Fulton County Jail is a cesspool. It's why Rikers people are dying in Rikers Island. We have a problem with cops and we have a problem with political discourse where people can lie with abandon. Very violent people are lying with abandon and they're not friends of the cops. These are the people who the same people who spread lies about Black Lives Matter protesters are the same ones who beat the crap out of 150 cops on January 6. Curtis Sliwa, you got something you want to say? You're not coming in to our city, our state and our country anymore. If the politicians won't do it, the people will do it. Look how they cheer. Look how they cheer the violence, because it's Fox News. If you protest fossil fuels by interrupting the U.S. Open peacefully, you're a terrorist. This week, 61 cop city protesters in Atlanta were indicted as terrorists down in Atlanta. But shutting down the city, you just heard Curtis Sliwa on Sean Hannity's Fox News talking about shutting down the city to protest undocumented migrants or, you know, storming the Capitol to prevent Joe Biden from being president. That's legitimate political discourse. I heard that this week from the racist governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, 
who was saying that the jail sentences for January Sixers was excessive, that it was just a protest. And some of those people rioted. And he said he, he spread the lie again. He said the Biden Justice Department would never have prosecuted the January Sixers if they were Black Lives Matter protesters. And as I pointed out, as all of you know, let's state the obvious. If Black Lives Matter protesters stormed the Capitol the way the January Sixers did, they would have been massacred. They would have been massacred because, as Ron DeSantis warned last week after Hurricane Idalia, you loot, we shoot. You loot, we shoot. Unless you're white and carrying the Confederate flag. So who is sending the migrants to New York City? We have a problem with migrants. And Curtis Sliwa is really angry at the migrants for wanting to come to this great country. But he's not angry at Ron DeSantis. He's not angry at Greg Abbott for putting the migrants on the bus. Uh, so we have a situation here in New York. Uh uh, Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, is loading up buses and viciously shipping migrants, women and children, to sanctuary cities like New York City, right? Something like 100,000 migrants have come to New York City in the past year. That's what they say, okay? And they're saying that the homeless shelters are overflowing because of the migrant crisis. Can't have anything to do with unaffordable real estate. See how this works? The the average rent in New York City is like $4,500 a month, something like that. But people are homeless because of the migrants. That's see how you see how we use migrants, we demonize migrants to protect moneyed interests. You can't get into a homeless shelter now. Can't be because there's a shortage of housing. It's the migrants. Supposedly, there are 100,000 migrants who have come to New York City in the past year, and that's why the homeless shelters are filled up, right? Unbelievable. We use migrants, we use immigrants to, to demonize so that the richest 1% are never blamed for being, for example, greedy landlords, okay? So supposedly 100,000 migrants have come to New York City in the past year. And because New York City elected a cop, Eric Adams used to be a cop. He's a Democrat, right? He's a cop. And like a typical New York City cop, he's in a state of panic over these migrants. What are we going to do? I don't know what to do. I, I have a gun. Should I shoot? I'm a cop and I'm a mayor. This is our cop mayor talking about the busloads of migrants. And remember, the idiots in my town elected a cop because we wanted to feel safe. Let me tell you something. When you elect a cop, the last thing you're going to feel is safe. OK, that was New York City's liberal New York City's response to Black Lives Matter. Georgia was busy electing a record number of prosecutors who are people of color. Uh, we elected a cop. Granted, he's a person of color, but we elected a cop. That was our response to Black Lives Matter. Cops are the most frightened people in the city. Again, I don't hate cops. I don't trust them, especially the ones in New York City. Here is our cop mayor, Eric Adams, spoon feeding Fox News and the state of Texas a year's worth of talking points about liberal elitists, coastal elitists not being able to handle the migrant crisis. Here we go. This issue will destroy New York City destroy New York City. This issue will destroy New York City. The migrants, that's what's going to destroy New York City. Not the, the Russian oligarchs who are buying up all the apartments here and leaving them empty and there's no place to live. It's the migrants. 
Okay, please continue, frightened cop mayor. The the migrants coming from Texas are are what's going to destroy New York City. This is what happens when you elect a cop to do a man's job. I don't mean to offend women. Our mayor is uh, a cop. Uh, What are you going to do? You have a little problem. The homeless shelters are filling up and uh, you're a cop. So what do you do? Get a gun and start shooting people inside the homeless shelters to make room for more people. Is that the solution? You're the mayor and you think a few busloads of migrants is going to destroy this city? My grandparents were migrants. The city was built by undocumented migrants. And I don't know if you've noticed, cop mayor, but New York City is effing empty like the space between your ears. Okay, nobody's working here anymore. Have you noticed what's happening? Something like 40 percent of commercial real estate is empty. That's what they're willing to admit here in New York City. They're willing to admit that something like 30 to 40 percent of commercial real estate is empty. And there's a big crash. There's a big real estate crash, big commercial real estate crash about to happen. Did it ever occur to you that maybe these migrants, you moron, are a godsend? You can fill these empty buildings with the migrants and put them to work doing the jobs that are unfilled, right? The tight labor market, you moron. Continue with your law and order cop panic, mayor and cop Eric Adams. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. I don't see an ending to this. This is the mayor of New York City. Right? Greatest city in the world. There's no problem we can't solve. This this is like, you know, Winston Churchill. I've never felt more inspired. This is like hearing Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okay, this is we got 100,000 migrants who are a godsend, as all immigrants are. Okay, they don't commit migrants, don't commit crime. And when they work, they pay into Social Security. Here is our cop mayor. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. I don't see an ending to this. You don't see an ending to this? Well, here's an idea. Quit. We that's what you're telling us. You don't see an ending to the migrants coming to New York City. (sighs) Uh, Okay. Uh, This is what you get when you ask a cop to make everybody feel safe. Right. This is, you know, you get that security blanket uh, and this is a Democrat Right. This is the Democrat serving up red meat talking points for Texas. I mean, Texas is laughing at our mayor. Right. They're going to see all of a sudden. Now, you know what it's like for us. Right. That's the talking point. It's going to be flooded over the weekend when you watch Fox News. They're going to be flooding the airwaves with Eric Adams saying he can't handle the migrants. Texas Senator Ted Cruz, do you have a message for our mayor? Kiss my ass. Okay, thank you. Well, Vivek Ramaswamy thinks we're not deporting enough migrants. In fact, he says we're not deporting enough children who are citizens of the United States. This guy is the, the, the Mehdi Hassan, if you watch him on MSNBC, he's the best. Uh, uh, anyway, Vivek uh, says that when he's president, he's uh, going to start deporting entire families, including children who are American citizens. Now, the, the, the 14th Amendment states that all persons who are born or naturalized in the United States 
are citizens of this country. In other words, and this is a beautiful thing, this is uh, what makes me proud to be an American, the 14th Amendment. By the way, you know, the, the 14th Amendment is a thing of beauty, and it, it makes up for all the crimes that this country committed before the Civil War. It's really our second constitution, the 14th Amendment. And uh, anyway, uh, one of the sections of the 14th Amendment says, if you come to America, if you sneak in here and you're not a citizen and then you have a baby, that baby is automatically an American citizen. And as the grandson of four, I, four of my grandparents were, were migrants. And that gives me the chills. And I don't know how many of my grandparents actually became citizens. I don't know. I'm told they were citizens, but who knows and who cares? Uh, that's the 14th Amendment, that pesky 14th Amendment that says, doesn't matter how your parents got in here. If they, if your mom gave birth to you on American soil, you are an American citizen. The pesky 14th Amendment that Ramaswamy, Yale Law School prick, Ramaswamy, he says, I don't care what's in the 14th Amendment. When I'm president, an undocumented migrant gives birth to a U.S. citizen on American soil. I'm deporting the baby along with the parents. Why would he say that? Because it's cruel, hateful. That's why he said it. The, the parents must go. The kids must go because that's precisely how you get dumb white Republican voters to take out their frustration. You, you make sure they're taking it out on people who had nothing to do with their immiseration. Who's causing all the unhappiness that you see among stupid, white, deeply religious Republican voters? We know who's doing it. We know. Can't blame the oil companies, the health insurance companies, right? Need a scapegoat. Babies. Not the fetuses, but Spanish-speaking little babies who won't learn the language because, you know, they're like two months old and they, they don't speak English. So we got to ship them back to Haiti. Out. Nobody benefits from it except Vivek Ramaswamy because stupid bigots uh, get energized by that. This is all just about fueling hate with no remedy. It's just hatred for the sake of hatred to distract. We know this game. We know it. It's, it's a cliche to keep reminding everybody. Well, you know, the 14th Amendment is really problematic. Uh, it gives citizenship to babies born here. Also in the 14th Amendment is a section that says anyone who was elected uh, and then to an office and then participated in or aided and abetted an insurrection is banned from ever serving in public office again. So that would mean Trump. You know, if you're going to be if we were a civilized country, if this were Sweden, Norway, Denmark, France, Germany, Spain, everyone would say, yes, that was an insurrection. Trump, according to the 14th Amendment, is banned. Uh, not yet. But six Colorado citizens, as we talked about yesterday, are now suing the state attorney general of Colorado to scrub Trump's name off the Republican ballot for the primaries, all right? I, I, you know, I read, I thought, oh, they're going to do it for the general election, but no, uh, they want to get his name scrubbed from the Republican primary in Colorado as well. I think this is going to be a problem uh, because the Secretary of State in Colorado 
is not just a Democrat. She's also a woman. Her name is Jenna Griswold. And I don't think Republicans are going to be too keen on a Democrat who's a woman scrubbing Republican primary ballots. I think that's I, I hope she succeeds. I think that's a bit of a stretch. I have a feeling she has a better chance uh, scrubbing Trump, scrubbing his name off the ballot for the general election. I, I don't see it happening in, in the primaries. And as if Trump doesn't have enough lawyers working for him, he's had to hire some attorneys in Colorado to challenge this lawsuit. Nice, right? They're insisting there is no legal basis for this lawsuit. And lawyers for Donald Trump filed a motion on Friday to have this case dismissed immediately. One of the lawyers representing Trump in this case is Colorado Secretary of State. He served between 2011 and 2015. His name is Scott Gessler. And yes, he's a Republican. So the 14th Amendment challenge will probably also take place in Arizona and New Hampshire. And there is precedent for this, recent precedent for this. And that precedent is this moron, the founder of Cowboys for Trump, Coey Griffin. He used to be a county commissioner in New Mexico, but then he stormed the Capitol on January 6th, and moron that he is, cowboy for Trump, took some selfies of himself storming the Capitol. So on September, in September of last year, a New Mexico judge uh, removed Corey Griffin, Coey Griffin, founder of Cowboys for Trump. He removed him as county commissioner, citing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and uh, Coey Griffin issued a statement when he heard about this lawsuit. He said, I'm against it. Well, more reason to go through with it. A judge late Friday rejected former Trump chief of staff Mark Meadows request to have his Georgia racketeering trial bumped up into a federal courtroom. During an evidentiary hearing last week, Meadows said since he is indicted for crimes that he allegedly committed as a federal employee, the Constitution's supremacy clause renders him immune from state and local prosecution. During the hearings, Meadows said as White House chief of staff, it was his job to set up the infamous call with Georgia's secretary of state where both Trump and Meadows insisted voter fraud was so rampant, election fraud was so rampant in Georgia that the election must be overturned in Trump's favor. Judge Stephen Jones ruled that Meadows was hired to serve as White House chief of staff, and that job does not include assisting Donald Trump in Donald Trump's reelection campaign. Judge Jones said that all the crimes Meadow will be tried for are political in nature and had nothing to do with serving his position as White House chief of staff. Meadow said he will appeal the decision. And this ruling will have a far reaching effect on several of Meadow's 18 co-defendants down in Georgia. One of those co-defendants, Donald Trump has indicated he, on Thursday his lawyers filed a motion saying that they might file a motion. They filed a motion to say they might file a motion to bump Donald Trump's trial up into a federal courtroom. Now, there would be two advantages for Trump if he could get this Fulton County indictment into a federal courtroom. One advantage is... If it's in a federal courtroom, he can make a case that as president or as a former president, he is immune from prosecution, that the crimes he's uh, accused of were committed while he was president, and therefore he has some kind of immunity. It's bogus, but he certainly can't make that immunity claim in a state court. So he wants it in a, in a federal courtroom. More importantly... The jury pool in Fulton County, 
where the indictments were filed by Fonnie Willis, that's Biden country. I think Biden got like 75 percent of the vote in Fulton County. And that's going to be a problem for Trump because the jury pool isn't going to be too sympathetic to Donald Trump. And moving the trial into a federal courtroom in Atlanta would allow Trump to draw from a much wider swath of Georgia, especially the red counties that went overwhelmingly for Trump in 2020. They went overwhelmingly for Trump in 2020, just not enough to put him over the top. He lost. Well, as if Rudy Giuliani, let me go big on this. That's a, a recent picture of Rudy Giuliani. Uh, as if Rudy doesn't have uh, enough on his legal plate, lawyers representing the mother and daughter, uh, you know, the Fulton County election workers who are suing Rudy for defamation. Well, their lawyers say they now want an additional one hundred thousand dollars in legal fees to refresh your memory. Last week, Rudy forfeited that case, meaning he refused to participate in the discovery phase. Discovery is where before the trial starts, you have to hand over all the evidence to the opposing attorneys. Every, you have to share all the evidence so there are no surprises so people can mount their cases. Uh, but he, Rudy wouldn't turn over any documents. So the plaintiff's lawyers couldn't make their case and the judge ruled, OK, you forfeited and... Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss, the mother and daughter, who had to go into hiding after Rudy and Trump accused them of stuffing ballots for Biden. The judge said, you won. You won. And a trial date will be scheduled soon to determine just how much Rudy must pay in damages. Could be in the millions. Meanwhile, Rudy has agreed to pay about $100,000, maybe $120,000 towards their legal fees. On Thursday, lawyers for Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss filed a motion saying they want an additional $100,000 from Rudy. Well, one of the, the many things I'm looking forward to is in this defamation suit, uh, they're, they're now going to start a trial to determine how much damage was done to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss and Rudy, if you remember the Alex Jones defamation lawsuit last year where he defaulted and had to pay damages, you have to open up the books. And this is going to be fun. Rudy has to show everything in its public record. And he'll be compelled to put his entire financial record before the court so they can determine how much he has and how much, therefore, should be awarded It'll be fun to see just how broke Rudy is and what he actually gets paid for his various roles as a podcast host, you know, radio shows, his consulting, where he claims to get that if you want to hire him, he charges $20,000 a day. So it'll be interesting to see what people pay Rudy these days. Rudy on Thursday filed a motion uh, in the Fulton County trial to have those indictments be thrown out, insisting that since and this, I couldn't believe when I read this. He said his lawyers said and, law, you know, as I showed you yesterday with the Peter Navarro trial, if you pay a lawyer, he will say whatever you want. As long as your check clears, he'll say whatever you want. Rudy's checks, I don't think, are clearing. So I'm surprised his lawyers actually said this. But this is what the lawyers in their motion said. This is why they think the uh, phony Willis's racketeering indictment for Rudy should be thrown out. Uh, they said since he's already being sued in civil court for defamation, right, the, the Ruby... Freeman, Shea Moss, defamation suit, since he's already being sued in a civil court, putting him on trial in a criminal court constitutes double jeopardy 
because part of that criminal indictment includes the false claims he made about Ruby Friedman and Shea Moss, who sued him for defamation. He's saying that's double jeopardy. How much are you willing to bid on double jeopardy, Rudy? You have no money. You just paid a lawyer to say something that even I know, even I know is complete horseshit. The defamation lawsuit, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, that's in a civil courtroom. It's not a criminal trial. It's a civil courtroom. The Fulton County indictment that you want to have thrown out is in a criminal courtroom. So that is not double jeopardy. I'm pretty sure a a 12-year-old knows this. Remember O.J., Rudy? He was found not guilty in a criminal trial, but they later found him guilty in a civil trial. That's not double jeopardy. Even I know that. But he got his lawyers. I don't know where the money's coming from. I heard the $100,000 plate uh, fundraiser at Bedminster Thursday night did not go well. Uh, lawyers will, will do, if you're angry, you're, you're just, you're, it's perfect. Yes, you know, whatever you want. Watch Peter Navarro. I'm going to show you the clip of Mike Lindell. These, these rageaholics, when they get their hands on the uh, legal system, they lose all their money because lawyers are scumbags and they're just waiting for an angry schmuck like Peter Navarro or Rudy or Donald Trump or Mike Lindell to come along. And they go, yes, you, you deserve justice. It's going to cost you a little, but you deserve it. <sighs> what was I talking about? Uh, before the grand jury in Fulton County, Georgia, indicted 19 people, including Donald Trump, there was an investigative grand jury that was convened last year. It's called a special grand jury, and it can't indict, but it helps a prosecutor like Fawny Willis workshop a criminal trial by bringing in sworn witnesses before the jury. And then after hearing all the testimony, the, the special grand jury issues a report so the special grand jury, it's kind of like a focus group. It's, you get to workshop. I have, I have an idea for some indictments. I'm not sure it's going to test well, so let me run these by you. It's like, you know, when Dave Chappelle is getting a Netflix special ready, right? And, and so, you know, he, he, he'll take it on the road and say, you know, should I trash transgender people? Or should I trash the LGBT community? Or should I trash transvestites? Or should I trash drag queens? He'll try to figure out, you know, what subject he should talk about by taking it on the road and workshopping it. Do, do I make the world dangerous for drag queens? Let's try that. Or should I make the world dangerous for transgender children. Let me see how that works. Should I just make the world unsafe for the entire LGBTQ community? That's you know how Dave workshops a, and that's kind of what a special grand jury is. It helps Fawny Willis get her Netflix special, <laughs> special together. And, uh, and so the special grand jury was convened last year and they broke up and they issue a report before they leave. And they say, you know, this is what we think you got. This is what we think you don't have. And uh, the special grand jury is non-binding. The indictments are non-binding. The report was unsealed on Friday. And we are now learning that the special grand jury recommended more than double the number of people who Fawny Willis ended up indicting. Uh, among those the jury recommended to indict was Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, for his calls to the Georgia Secretary of State, urging him to throw out pro-Biden absentee ballots. 
in December of 2020, Lindsey Graham got on the phone with Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State, and urged him to throw out pro-Biden absentee ballots. They also recommended that Boris Epstein, one of Trump's political advisors, as well as one of the lawyers on Rudy Giuliani's election fraud strike force, they recommended Boris Epstein to be indicted. And there are some people who uh, think Boris Epstein is one of the unindicted co-conspirators in special counsel Jack Smith's indictment of Donald Trump for election interference. They also recommended that Cleta Mitchell, a conservative lawyer who was in on Trump's infamous call to the Georgia Secretary of State, she was sitting in on that. They recommended that she get indicted. And they recommended the very dangerous, very dangerous, unhinged, retired general Michael Flynn, the batshit crazy national security advisor who had to be pardoned by Trump after he was found guilty of lying to the FBI about his contacts with Russia. Obama warned Trump. He said, do not make Michael Flynn, your national security advisor, he's unhinged. Obama got that right. Take a look at what uh, Michael Flynn is doing these days. In December of 2020, according to the January 6th report, Flynn participated in several meetings where a memo was drafted in which Trump would seize the ballot boxes in several battleground states by invoking the Insurrection Act. Uh, I know he's a retired general, but don't don't we discipline members of the military who who conspire? Uh, I seem to remember reading Seven Days in May. I think there, there's I think that's criminal for a retired general to talk about seizing the ballot boxes. And Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, was at that meeting. I'm telling you, he's a Roach Motel. Anybody who comes into Donald Trump's circle is a halfwit, demented moron with anger issues. And they just gravitate to Trump. He loves them. He's a Roach Motel. And they crawl in and they can't get out. They can't get out. Well, Senator Lindsey Graham was asked to comment on Friday about what he thought about almost getting indicted. And here's what he said on Friday. At the end of the day, nothing happened. What I did was consistent with my job as being United States Senator, chairman of the Judiciary Committee. But it was just not me. Three United States senators were opening up Pandora's box. I think the system in this country is getting off the rails and we have to be careful not to use the legal system as a political tool. Yes. Anytime you're accused of a crime and you're a Republican senator, we're using the legal system as a political tool. Cannot indict a Republican lawmaker because it's political. Here is he, he called According to Brad Raffensperger, he said that Lindsey Graham called him, identified himself as Lindsey Graham. I'm the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Can you throw out some absentee ballots from uh, counties that are heavily Biden? Right. That was he was investigating the Pandora's box of election fraud. So says Lindsey Graham. He went on to say. It, if it ever becomes impossible or politically dangerous or legally dangerous for a United States senator to call up people to find out how the election was wrong, God help us all. <laughs> yeah, this is Lindsey Graham. Uh, I'm calling up just to, I think the election's wrong because I want Biden to lose. So can you throw out some of his absentee ballots? I'm just calling. I'm just making an inquiring phone call as to whether or not. You'll do this for me and Donald Trump, and then we can pay you back in a couple of years with a, a great job. 
Well, Senator Lindsey Graham, by the way, uh, interesting thing about him, he's a conservative uh, Republican who represents South Carolina. I don't know if you know this about him. Uh, he's a confirmed bachelor. Did you know that about Senator Lindsey Graham? Confirmed. He's a confirmed bachelor. He's in his mid-60s. Never met the right woman. And that was a bit of an issue back in 2016 when Lindsey Graham, the South Carolina senator, was running for president against Donald Trump. A lot of conservative Christians, you know, they run the Republican Party and they wanted to know why exactly Lindsey Graham could not find the right woman. And some people, there were rumors that Lindsey wasn't looking hard enough, right? That, that was the rumor. And Lindsey Graham isn't looking hard enough. I mean, come on, half this country are females, and he can't find the right one? Especially, you're Lindsey Graham. You're a catch. You're a United States senator, Lindsey. You can have any woman you want. And yet, he can't find the right woman. And in 2016, when he was running for president against Donald Trump, there were rumors being spread. And a lot of people were starting to whisper that the real reason Lindsay, a confirmed bachelor, hasn't found the right woman is because he's picky. He's picky. Very picky. Turns out there's another senator from South Carolina who can't find the right woman. Senator Tim Scott, like Lindsey Graham, he too is running for president against Donald Trump. And Axios reports that Tim Scott is having trouble with conservative donors because he hasn't found the right woman. And uh, that's what the conservative donors are saying. They're saying, we, you know, we can't give to Tim Scott because he's not married. That's what they're saying, because that sounds so much more Christian than we're not giving to him because he's black. <laughs> he's, he's not married. That's why we're not donating to Tim Scott. Uh, he's not He's not married. It has nothing to do with his being black. Uh, it's because he's not married to a black woman. We, we want to know why he's not married to a black woman. Can you imagine? Tim Scott says, you know what? OK, to please my conservative donors, I'm getting married. And then she turns out to be white. And the donors would be saying, you know, on second thought, maybe a bachelor in the White House isn't such a bad idea. You can work longer hours. We can get more work out of you if you're not married. Anyway, uh, Tim Scott is now dealing with a whisper campaign. Republican operatives, some people are saying it's Ron DeSantis who's spreading these rumors. They're questioning why Tim Scott can't seem to find the right woman. You know, and Scott says he's in a relationship but nobody's ever seen her. It's weird, isn't it? You know, you got these two Republican senators, Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott. Why is it so hard for these two Republican senators from South Carolina to settle down and find the right woman? You know, you know what I think it might be? I, I bet there's a problem with women in South Carolina. They don't have penises. Meanwhile, new polling of likely Iowa caucus goers shows Donald Trump leading Ron DeSantis by 37 points. But there is concern that Trump's operation in Iowa is underfunded and his ground game has gotten so bad, Donald Trump Jr. is starting to complain that there are no, quote, adults in the room, the, the son is saying we need adults in the room. 
Don Jr. is reportedly upset that Trump's staff has no idea what they're doing. Of course, they have no idea what they're doing. That's why they're working for Donald Trump. Trump is also reportedly uh, consumed by his legal bills. He's obsessed with how much all these lawsuits are costing him. And he's also obsessing on staying out of prison. He seems to be scared. Consequently, he's making fewer trips to Iowa than any of his competitors. And while he does have a 37 point lead, according to the latest polling in Iowa, not showing up, you need a ground game in Iowa. This is retail. Iowa is retail politics. It's meeting the candidate up close. And this, you know, avoiding Iowa can come back to bite him in the ass because Iowa caucuses are unpredictable. If you remember, Trump lost in 2016 to Ted Cruz. Right, Ted? Kiss my ass. Yes. Okay. You uh, you beat Donald Trump in 2016 in the Iowa caucus, and he, he called election fraud. He accused you of election fraud. Kiss my ass. Okay. Donald Trump's lies about his net worth turned out to be far more imaginative than anyone could have ever guessed. That's according to New York State Attorney General Letitia James, whose civil trial charging Trump with fraud begins the first week of October. It's happening, okay? He has a, he has a big civil trial that starts on October 2nd. And this is like Rudy having to turn over his financials. This is, we're going to get a glimpse into just how much money Donald Trump has. And while I just go over this with you, let's take a look at Ivan, Ivana Trump's grave. It's always important to remember how Ivana Trump was buried at Bedminster Golf Course. In a motion filed on Friday... The state attorney general, Letitia James, says closer review of Trump's financial documents during the discovery phase now reveal that Trump's deception was far greater than she could have imagined when she first indict first indicted him. She called it staggering. Letitia James, the attorney general, writes that between the years 2011 and 2021, Donald Trump inflated his net worth each year by as much as $3.6 billion per year. Attorney General Le Tisha James accuses Trump and his two idiot sons of preparing phony financial statements, claiming the value of their properties were much higher than they actually were in order to secure loans from banks. That's fraud. And then on the same properties, they would lowball the value when it came to paying taxes. So for the time being, Letitia James is asking for $250 million in fines and a five-year ban on any of the Trump people from doing business in New York State. They're permanently banned, by the way, from uh, running a charity. That happened before he even became president. They had some charity going, and that turned out to be a scam. So in order to understand Letitia James's civil trial, the attorney general of New York State is trying Donald Trump in civil court asking for damages. This won't be a criminal trial. This is a civil trial. Uh, how does it work? Like, what, what does it mean to like, we're talking about numbers that none of us understand. So I was trying to figure out, like, wh why would you inflate the value of your property? What, you know, what, how is that fraud? And I thought, so, and I read about, okay, so you stole from the mob and you have all these properties that you really don't own and you owe money to the mob and they're going to kill you because you stole from the mob. So you need to borrow money from, say, Deutsche Bank and take that borrowed money and give it 
to Vlad and Igor, right? And how do you get that? How do you borrow money? Well, you say, for example, okay, you need you need collateral, and and so you have to inflate the value of your property. That's your collateral, and the bank will say, oh, okay, your your apartment in Trump Tower is worth $100 million, you can borrow against that. We'll give you $50 million. And if you can't pay it back, we, we take the entire apartment, right? That's collateral. Okay. Let me give you an example of how this works. Okay. After Trump's first wife, we just saw how she was buried. Very regal. Very regal. Uh, for example, after Ivana Trump, uh, that would be Donald Trump's first wife and mother of his three idiot kids. If you recall, last year she was pushed down a flight of stairs and tragically died. Okay, that's not that's not fair. I, did I say pushed down a flight of stairs? I meant to say she was thrown down a flight of stairs. Uh, okay. You know, I, I honestly think she fell. I, a lot of my friends say, come on, you know Trump had some. You know what? Donald Trump, if, if Donald Trump conspired to have Ivana killed, she'd still be alive. <laughs> right? He would have like, you know, he would have gotten, he wouldn't want to have paid the right hit man. So Rudy, I'll do it. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. And Rudy would walk into the apartment to kill her and he'd say, oh, look, free whiskey. Let's see what kind of cable package Ivana has. Three days later, Rudy wakes up in Ivana's living room. She's standing over him and he's going, hey, I, I know an Armenian dry cleaner who can get my urine stains off the rug. But the couch, that's going to be a problem. I don't think they're going to be able to get my urine stains off the couch and Ivana would throw him out of the apartment and she'd still be alive because Donald Trump would never spring for, you know, a hitman who knew what he was doing. So I, I don't think Donald Trump pushed her down a flight of stairs. I think she died. I think she fell down a flight of steps. And I think it's very sad that that happened. But luckily, boy, did he give her the headstone, right at Bedminster on the back nine. Well, that's that is Ivana Trump's gravesite. And as I said yesterday, you can literally. I don't even think. I, I see her toes popping up through the grass. I don't even think they paid anybody to shovel six feet down. <laughs> Very sad. Okay, what was I talking about? Okay, so. Uh, inflating the value of your properties to borrow against it. So when Ivana died, and it's very sad, Donald said, this is great. We'll sell her townhouse for $27 million. And a year later, nobody wants to buy the townhouse for $27 million. So they've cut the price by $4 million, okay? So I'm assuming... This $27 million townhouse was left to the kids and they decided, OK, we'll borrow against mom's townhouse and we'll tell the bank it's worth $27 million. We'll put it up for sale and borrow against it and tell the bank we can get $27 million for it. And the bank says, OK. We'll lend you fifteen million if you can't pay us back. We get the we get the townhouse, and that's basically what Trump is being sued for. That's how I understand this. It, it's a little confusing to me that people would like. How do you live with yourself owing you know money to the mob? So that's I think that's how it works, and. Then when you have to pay taxes, you say the house is worth a million dollars. It's fraud. And this trial in the state of New York is coming up October 2nd, and it's going to be really interesting. 
uh, really interesting. Enrique Terrio, the former chairman of the Proud Boys, was sentenced to 22 years in prison this week for seditious conspiracy for the role he played instigating the January 6th attack on our nation's capital. And he gave a phone interview from jail to the New York Times on Friday. Very interesting conversation. Now, Enrico Terrio says to the New York Times, federal prosecutors before the trial offered him a plea deal. And all Terrio needed to do was provide evidence that Donald Trump was in contact with him through intermediaries, the, the, the FBI, the Justice Department, is very interested now in trying to prove that Donald Trump, through intermediaries, was communicating with the Proud Boys in the lead up to the attack on the Capitol. According to the interview with Enrique Terry on The New York Times, you should read it. It's really interesting. Terrio says he refused to make that plea deal. He insisted that Trump had absolutely no contact with him through intermediaries. And you know what? I believe him. At least the part about Trump not needing intermediaries to talk to Enrique Terrio. Proud Proud boys, boys, stand back and stand by. Yeah. He didn't need intermediaries. He just, during the debate, right? He just said... Proud Proud boys, stand back and stand by. Here's what I think, and this is conjecture. I think Enrique Terrio is reading the wrong polls and thinks Donald Trump is going to win. And he figures he'll get pardoned because they were all promised to be pardoned. And it's very complicated with Enrique Terrio because he was an FBI informer. So not only an FBI informer, he was also an informer with the Washington, D.C. Police Intelligence Unit. So there are many, many layers to Enrique Terrio. So I don't know what he's eventually going to do to get out of prison uh, or if he'll end up staying there for, what do you get, 22 years? Maybe. Well, this is... uh, I'm getting to Mike Lindell. It's it's so vulgar. I need to put it at the end. Uh, I just don't want to get dinged by any of the podcasting services because it's so vulgar. If you put it up front, they ding you. And I, I can't be... I've been getting dinged and I don't want to get dinged. Most of you are too young to know who L. Brent Bozell is. He is uh, L. Brent Bozell III. He's the founder of the Media Research Center. And he is one of the angriest conservatives I've ever seen in my life on television. They can't put him on television anymore. But, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, you used to see him on the, and he was just seething with rage. And he's a paleo conservative. He has a perfect pedigree. He's William F. Buckley's nephew, and his father, uh, L. Brent Bozell II, attended Yale with Bill Buckley. They were debating partners, and the Bozells were very much in on the development of the National Review. And L. Brent Bozell, you know, you can't have him around the office. He's kind of he, he's so angry. The, whole, the trick to being a successful Republican conservative is to put a shiny, happy face to the bile or do what William F. Buckley did and, and use indecipherable words. But, you know, you have a sunny disposition like Reagan, who was secretly a racist, not so secretly, or, you know, George W. Bush or George Herbert Walker Bush. The only honest Republican turned out to be Donald Trump, who was just... The guy who told 50,000 lies as president turned out to be the most honest Republican. He just, you know, banned the Muslims, banned the Mexicans, you know, uh, crushed their skulls. L. Brent Bozell is not just the id of the Republican Party. 
He's the ego and the super ego. They are, you know, it's just rage. It's just anger and hatred. And you don't see him anymore on television. But go look him up on YouTube. He is really who all Republicans are. And uh, just an angry guy. And he, you know, he's an election denier, even though he, he was he called Trump a charlatan until Trump got the nomination and then he got on board and he's got a son named uh, Leo Brent Bozell the fourth and uh, Leo Brent Bozell uh, the fourth uh, participated in the uh, the January 6th attack on the Capitol got all the way into the United States Senate chamber right this is the, the son of L. Brent Bozell III, Bill Buckley's nephew, right? This is like the perfect conservative pedigree. He got all the way into the United States Senate chamber. He was videotaped <laughs> ransacking Nancy Pelosi's officer. I'm telling you, when I read this, I went, he's just like his father, right? You can't put him on television. He'll ransack the set. Uh, on Friday, he was found guilty. Uh, on 10 charges of uh, ransacking the Capitol. Uh, five felonies. His sentencing is scheduled for January. That is L. Brent Bozell's son. This is, this is, he's about 45. And that rage was inside a Reagan, Buckley, the Bush family, the whole Republican Party, if you can't hide the rage, you end up getting arrested, ransacking the Capitol. Remember the uh, zip tie guy and his mom, the great, uh, great mother and her son, the zip tie guy? They, they stormed the Capitol. I miss my mom. I read this story today and I thought, oh, my, I miss mom. Uh, on Friday, Eric Munchell, he's 32, he's from Tennessee, he got sentenced to five years in prison. He's the, the zip tie guy. He brought zip ties into the uh, Senate to tie up lawmakers. And his mom, his mom came with him. His mother came with him, Lisa Eisenhart, 59. And she got sentenced to two and a half years in prison for, you know, packing the lunch. She probably drove him to the Capitol. How long are you going to go? How long are you going to be? You know, I'm going to go with you. This, this would be a good way for us to bond. I miss my mother. Uh, and I wish I had a mother like Lisa Eisenhart who would, you know, hold my zip ties, come with me as I storm the Capitol. I mean, think about it. Whose mom, like, this? what a cool mom, right? Like, she's the one who would let you drink on Friday if you were 16 or 7. Like, just stay in the basement. She'd be the one, you know, better you drink in the basement than you go out and crash the car. You know, that kind of mom. I'd rather have them smoking dope in the house than smoking dope uh, where I can't keep an eye on them. But she's, that's the kind of, I, you know, uh, anyway. He's going to have great memories. He's going to be five years in prison, and he'll have plenty of time to think about what a great mother he had who took him to the Capitol, packed him a lunch. You know, I miss my mom, but I didn't have a mother like that. I think the closest I had to, you know, storming the Capitol with zip ties, the closest I had to that, I, I remember my mom took me to see E.T. And uh, <laughs> um, I'm not going to say the word. She told me to uh, act like a man when I cried at the end of E.T. That's my more memory. She was disgusted by me because I was crying at the end of uh, E.T. She didn't say act like, <laughs> okay.
anyway, zip tie guy and his mom. To anyone who's ever had a mom, huh? Mothers. Patrick Alonzo Stedman, uh, I believe he was supposed to marry Oprah. Well, that's a different Stedman. Patrick Alonzo Stedman of Haddonfield, New Jersey, is a professional dating coach. And the professional dating coach was sentenced on Friday to four years in prison for storming the Capitol on January 6th. The judge was going to let him off with just a warning until he discovered Patrick is a professional dating coach from New Jersey. This, this guy's married, he has kids, and he supports his family as a professional dating coach in New Jersey. You know, I grew up in New Jersey. I have a rough idea of what a professional dating coach in New Jersey does. He stands on the edge of the bed and says, choke up on it. There you go. That's it. Bend your knees. Okay, now go for a second. A professional dating coach. Okay. Is anybody still here? It's time for Mike Lindell. Mike Lindell is very cranky. He needs a good night's sleep. And he's not getting a... I think he needs to switch pillows. Uh, he is being sued for defamation by Dr. Eric Coomer, who used to work for Dominion Voting Systems. And Mike Lindell, who I thought was kind of harmless. I didn't think he was angry. I thought he was a goofball who kind of was religious. You know, you'll see in this deposition, he's got the cross around his neck. And I thought, you know, he damaged his brain from the crack. He used to be a crackhead and he needed someone to believe in. And he turned his life over to Jesus and that wasn't working. So he turned his life over to Donald Trump and went through an entire fortune. But I, I always thought of him as a, a true believer. Uh, and I didn't realize that he's sitting on a powder keg of rage. And uh, anyway, he's being sued for libel by Dr. Eric Coomer, who was uh, who worked for Dominion Voting Systems. He was director of product security or something. And uh, so there's a, a deposition. Attorneys for Dr. Coomer uh, deposed Mike Lindell. They tried three times. And each time Mike Lindell was reportedly vulgar, loud, disrespectful to the lawyers and to the court. He threatened them. He was evasive non-responsive. He stormed out. They had to bring him back for another deposition uh, weeks later. And in the defamation lawsuit, Dr. Coomer from Dominion Voting Machines accuses Mike Lindell of going on television and calling Dr. Coomer a traitor to the United States. And Mike Lindell is being sued for claiming that he that Dr. Coomer corralled Dominion voting machine employees to rig votes in the 2020 presidential election that, uh, in favor of Joe Biden, that Dr. Coomer was in on the steal. And uh, he, he accused Dr. Coomer of committing treason and that he then publicly stated that Dr. Coomer should turn himself into the, into the FBI and confess. And uh, so he's being sued by Dr. Coomer. Uh, separately, by the way, Dominion is suing separately Mike Lindell for $1.3 billion. Separate defamation suit. This is a personal defamation suit, but Dominion Voting Machines, they uh, they want $1.3 billion from Mike Lindell because uh, he made the same accusations. Well, you you know, you decide. So the the lawyers for Dr. Goomer, Coomer, uh, released some of the uh, 
deposition tapes to prove that Mike Lindell has been difficult during the depositions and uncooperative. You make you make your own decision. This is March eighth, twenty twenty three. What's your full name, please? Michael James Lindell. Well, good morning, Mr. Lindell. My name is Charlie Kane. We met for the first time about Who's paying you? about four minutes ago. Okay. Go. On. Is that right? What's it? Is that right? Is what was the question? We met for the first time. Yes, yes. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start slow. Because the court reporter is trying to take down what you're saying, okay? Don't sit and scold me already, mister. I'll do, I'll do whatever I have to do. So I don't, you're, you're not, you're just a lawyer. You're an ambulance chief's lawyer. So don't start with me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, do, I do feel my, Michael Kamer, I think that's the I thought I do feel he was trying to to provoke Mike Lindell. I, I thought uh, so. I'm, I'm going to right now. I still believe in Mike Lindell. I, I think uh, the he was being badgered by the attorney. Let's uh, watch a little more. You're not my boss. You're just a lawyer, frivolous lawyer. So go. Don't start you know scolding this... me. Oh, I'm asking questions. I'm not mm-hmm. going to scold you. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I got a sense that he was being scolded. And Mike Lindell is a very successful multi, multi negative millionaire. I think he owes $10 million. But you don't talk to a man like Mo Green that way, Michael. Please, uh, let's continue. I, I, very disrespectful to Mike Lindell, a national treasure. Okay, and I'm not asking about the lumpy pillow calls. Uh, no, they're not lumpy pillows. That's not what they call on. Okay. That when you say lumpy pillows, now you're an asshole. You got that? You're an asshole like is what you are. Like no, he's an asshole. No, he's an ambulance you. chasing asshole. That's what you are. Lumpy pillows, kiss my ass. Put that in your book. So uh, apparently they were asking about uh, lumpy pillows, which, by the way, was uh, my porn name. In uh, college, I used to do porn, and they, it was I. I, I have uh, gynecomastia, and uh, they would refer to my cleavage as lumpy pillows. Is it gynecomastia where men have large breasts? I don't know. There was a question in the deposition. It was very rude. They were talking about how people return the product if if they get a lumpy pillow. From the my pillow guy, and you know you're provoking the my pillow guy by bringing up lumpy pillows. So so far, I'm on Mike Lindell's. I think he's being reasonable. Uh, he's being disrespected and being reasonable, and he's upset that he's being sued for defamation because all he said was that Dr. Coomer should be hanged for treason. That's all he said, and now he's being sued for defamation. Larry Coomer did this directly to me, and I made one statement about him. Didn't say nothing for a whole year. Then you guys come up and serve me papers in Colorado. Boy, I'll bet there's statements after that, wasn't there? Then everybody knew that what he did to my pillow and Mike Lindell, how dare him come and sue my pillow. He's a scumbag for doing that. Put that in there, scumbag, S-C-U-M bag. That's what he is, What for what he did to me. Yeah, what he did... To, to you. What I'm saying Obviously, is, you don't have a my pillow, too. You don't, do you? What I'm saying is, Mr. Lindell. Asshole. I, oh, I, go ahead. No, I'm pissed. I understand. Now, go. When you're saying what? He's, he's pissed. It's, it's weird because he can't tell that he's pissed, so I'm glad he told us because he does such a... And unlike L. Brent Bozell III, Mike Lindell does such a great job hiding his seething rage. How dare they do that to him? How dare they? How dare him come and sue my pillow? Yeah, how, let me hear that again. How dare him come and sue my pillow? Hmm. He's speaking uh, Elizabethan English, I believe. He's actually, this deposition is in iambic pentameter. 
How dare him come and sue my pillow? Wow, he's brilliant. Please continue, Mike Lindell. I love this guy. Kiss my ass. <laughs> What a nice, so what a nice thing to say. Like I have a part of my, I call them my lumpy pillows. Kiss my lumpy pillows. I mean, what is a, a kinder, more generous offer than kiss my ass? So far, I'm not saying any hostility. Please continue, Mike Lindell. How dare him? Yeah, how dare him? Yes, you're. You're an asshole, like is what you are. Like no, he's an asshole. <laughs> I like the way he turns to get, you know, did you hear that? He, he's an, You're an asshole, like is what you are. Like no, he's an asshole. <laughs> like he needs confirmation that he was heard. All right, I got two more. I love this. Now you're an asshole. You got that? <laughs> This is me. This is like I'm watching him. I go, this this is who I am. This is this is if if I got lucky and then unlucky and then lucky again, I would be this guy. You're an asshole like is what you are. Like, no, sorry. he's an asshole. That, that's basically this podcast. That's essentially what this entire podcast is. It's just me saying. You're an asshole, like is what you are. Like, no, he's an asshole. <laughs> it's, it's, and repeating himself. That's, that's basically me. It's my show. I say something, and then I repeat it over and over. You're an asshole, like is it's, what you are. Like, no, sorry. he's an asshole. <laughs> that's me. I, I, can, I will finish. I'm going to wrap this up. But this is who I am. And... Uh, Wow. Anyway, uh, anything uh, you'd like to add, Mike Lindell? How dare him come and sue my pillow? <laughs> How dare him? Th this is who Donald Trump, he he's just bait. Donald Trump is bait for these unhinged, demented halfwits with, with rage issues. He, he thrives off these people. Rudy, General Michael Flynn, Steve Bannon, Peter Navarro, people who cannot control their, their rage. How dare him? <laughs> How dare him? You're an asshole, like is what you are. Like, no, sorry. he's an asshole. <laughs> Hang on. Rudy? Uh, do we have any Rudy here? Well, I don't have any Rudy today. No, that's it. All right. I may do a show tomorrow. I'm not sure. Yeah. I may. Oh, this is good. Kiss my ass. Oh, hang on. Is there anything you would like to say to Senator Cruz, Mike Lindell? Kiss my ass. Ooh. Hang on. Where is that? Kiss my ass. Hmm. What I'm saying... Obviously, is you don't have my pill. Larry Coomer did this directly oh, to me. Oh, hang on. And I made one... All right. Kiss my ass. Here we go. This is what I'm going to do for the next four hours. <laughs> Just listen to Mike Lindell's deposition. It's music. It's music. I like to see... Bad people in pain makes me gives me faith in the legal system. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you for listening. I went a little long tonight and I didn't mean to keep you waiting for the Mike Lindell stuff, but I get dinged if he's, you know, that stuff is the language. And so I have to put it on late. 